love of the dunya. The Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, said, Soon the nations will call one another against you, just as people call one another to eat from a platter of food. A man asked, Will this be because we will be few in number, O Messenger of Allah? He, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, replied, No, you will be large in number, but you will be guthaa, like the froth scum on the surface of a body of water. And Allah will remove from the hearts of your enemies their fear of you, and shall place in your hearts wahan. Those present asked, What is wahan, O Messenger of Allah? He replied, The love for this worldly life and hatred of death. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another episode of Purification of the Soul. We have with us in the studio our guests uh, from my right, uh, Kareem, Muhammad, and Gulraz. I'm your host, Abu Abdus Salam, and in the last few episodes we were talking about some of the evil characteristics or the diseases of the soul which, is, which are incumbent for a human being for a Muslim to remove himself of. The series is about purification of the soul, or tazkiyatun nufus. And at the beginning of this series, we defined the meaning of tazkiyah, or purification. Uh, we said there was a linguistic meaning and a technical meaning, and we said the linguistic meaning links with the technical meaning. What was the linguistic meaning? It means to purify and to increase. It had two main meanings. To purify and to increase. To purify and to increase. Technically, how was uh, how was tazkiyatun nufus defined? Uh, the purification of one's bad characteristics. To remove, purifi- purify, or cleanse oneself from bad and characteristics. And therefore, to increase it. And then and increase good, it with. Those are good. Good characteristics of the soul. So we can see the link between the technical meaning, with the uh, linguistic meaning, and. The next disease that we'd like to talk about now, that one should cleanse his soul from, is that of love of this world, hubbud dunya, hubbud dunya. Now, wealth is not something to be condemned in and of itself. It is the person's conduct pertaining to it that deserves blame. Why is this the case? Because it has the potential to, uh, to be used in a good way. So, because wealth has the potential to be used in a good way, and also it can be used for disobedience of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It can be used for disobedience of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So, really, it is the person's conduct pertaining to the wealth that really deserves blame, and this includes extreme eagerness for it, attaining it unlawfully, spending it inappropriately, or withholding it when it should be spent, or perhaps uh, being ostentatious with regards to it and showing it off. Proudly, and this is why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran, "Inna ma amwalukum wa auladukum fitna." Your wealth and your children are but a test. Now, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that two hungry wolves sent to some cattle are not as destructive to the cattle as a person's extreme eagerness for wealth and status uh, in his religion. And this was reported by Imam at Tirmidhi. And this is why the scholars of past, the early Muslim scholars, they would fear the burden and trial of wealth. The second Khalifa of Islam, Umar radiallahu anhu, he would see the conquest in his time. Of course, the conquests in his time were different to the conquests in the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in the time of his predecessor Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu in one major way. What was that? That is, the conquest spread far and wide. They spread much, much further. In the time of Umar radiallahu anhu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened the lands in the caliphate of Umar radiallahu anhu. Now, Umar radiallahu anhu would see this, would see all these conquests in his time, and this would lead him to cry. And he said, Allah did not withhold these conquests from his Prophet and from Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu for any harm that he intended for them both, and then give them to Umar for some good that he intended. 
for him. This shows his modesty also. Because we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he did in turn good out of giving these conquests to Umar radiallahu anhu. But out of his modesty, Umar, he said that Allah didn't, come, he didn't uh, withhold these conquests from Abu Bakr and the Prophet sallallahu for any evil matter. And that's true. But at the same time, the second part of his statement, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, he, he wouldn't have given it to Umar radiallahu anhu for good. Um, as we know, this is out of his modesty that he said this. And also this shows how scared and fearful he was of the wealth. Because obviously with conquests come wealth and trade and various other benefits of this life. Uh, Yahya ibn Mu'adh, uh, rahimahullah, again one of the early scholars, he said that wealth is a scorpion. If you are not good at averting its harm, then do not take it. Because if it stings you, its poison will kill you. And then it was said to him, how can we avert its harm? He replied, by obtaining it lawfully and spending it legitimately. So it's like a double-edged sword. If a person doesn't know how to deal with wealth, it can kill him. It can poison him, just like a scorpion can. But if a person knows how to deal with it, and he defined what is meant by dealing with it correctly, and that is? Spending it lawfully. Spending it lawfully and? Before spending it, Obtain, you need to? Obtaining it lawfully. Obtain obtaining it lawfully. lawfully. Obtain it lawfully. <coughs> so at the same time, wealth is a means that helps a person in this worldly, in his worldly as well as his religious affairs. And this is why a great scholar from the second generation of Muslims, the Tabi'een, uh, his name was Saeed ibn Musayyib, rahimahullah, he said that there is no goodness in a person who does not wish to accumulate wealth lawfully. This, is an, this to some might seem an odd statement. He says there's no goodness, there's no good in a person who does not wish to accumulate wealth <coughs> lawfully. What does he mean by this? I think accumulating wealth lawfully uh, implies working very hard, uh, doing something really worth gaining such in a large halal amount way. of money in, in a lawful lawfully. Way. Right. And as opposed to because a person could have been doing it in an unlawful way. And the unlawful way, it tends to be easier. Most and of the usually time. sometimes, the, yeah, the unlawful way can sometimes be easier. But, why did, he, why did he say there's no good in a person who doesn't want to accumulate? Accumulate meaning gathering. Well, jama'a in Arabic. To liyajma, to, yani, to, to gather and accumulate. Wealth lawfully. Why, why, why is he saying this? I guess um, if he doesn't accumulate the wealth, then he would, he'll be reliant on others. That's one reason. If a person does not have enough wealth to support himself and his family, he'll end up begging. And if a person has the ability to seek wealth lawfully, then he should do that. And there's another reason why he said this. One, one reason is because he doesn't, a, a person should gather wealth lawfully so that he doesn't have to rely on other people. He doesn't have to uh, start begging other people. But there's another reason for Can that. you say that the accumulation of wealth can help, help the Muslims as well? In which sense? Or help the individual in which sense? He can spend out of that in charity. He can spend it in charity. He can do rightful, lawful things. And this is why he said, the whole statement is that he said, there is no goodness in a person who does not wish to accumulate wealth lawfully so that he may protect himself from begging people, which is the point that Gulraz mentioned, and so that he can keep good relations with his kith and kin. In other words, how can he do that? He can spend money on his, 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 his uh, uncles and aunties and cousins and, and obviously his brothers and sisters, his parents, his children. He can spend money on them. And also he can give, give out its dues. How does he give out its dues? To pay the zakah. To pay the zakah, excellent. To pay the zakah. So if a person does not gather wealth lawfully, not only there are a number of uh, bad things associated with that. He'll be begging for people. Or he'll be forced to take wealth unlawfully. And likewise, he will be prohibited from doing a lot of good deeds. Like paying money to charity, hosting people. Hosting people is a very praiseworthy uh, action in Islam. To host them and, and accept them as guests and so on and so forth. And to spend on them. It's a praiseworthy thing. Likewise, to give charity. To give charity both uh, obligatory charity, which you mentioned, zakah, but also sadaqah, which is often referred to as voluntary charity, non-obligatory charity. 
So all this, when a person has some wealth, then he can, he can do these good deeds. And this is why Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib is teaching a very important principle here. And that is that a person should have wealth, or he should at least intend to get some wealth, to do these good deeds. And before that, to make sure that he doesn't have to rely and put out his hand in order to beg. And this goes on, this leads us to another statement by another famous, uh, famous scholar of the early generations of Muslims. His name was Sufyan, rahimahullah. Uh, he, said that, uh, he said that wealth in our time is a weapon for the believer. Is a weapon for the believer. He mentioned two things here. Firstly, it's a weapon. But also, secondly, he says it's a weapon for whom? For the believer. Now, what are these two? What can we get from this statement? These two points in the statement. Okay, it's a weapon if in the wrong, wrong hands can cause a lot of damage. If it's in the right hand, it can be used for... Just like a sword. Just like a sword it's or like, a gun. Which is what I think he mentioned at the end, for a believer. That's exactly the point that I wanted to mention. That if somebody has a gun, it can be used in a bad way. Obviously, he can murder someone and whatever. But in the same way, a gun can be used in a, in, a, in, a, in a good way. For example, if a person is defending himself. Or for a person, for a righteous Muslim policeman, for example, who is guarding the Muslims from any kind of evil coming to them. So in this case... The gun is a, a good thing. And likewise, so a weapon, so it's a weapon, and that's why he said for the believer. For the believer. So when a believer has a weapon, he uses it in, an, in the correct and right, righteous way. And this is exactly like wealth. If he has it, if a believer has wealth, a true believer, and this believer will use it as a weapon in his favor and not against him. Now inshallah, after the break, we'll have a look at more We'll have a look more about these kind of this this meaning or this understanding about wealth. Assalamu alaikum. You live on Ask Your Questions, please. I would like uh, Sheikh to um, comment on that and to give me uh, how can I answer. Listening to the adhan and repeating after the mu'addin is similarly a highly recommended act of worship. So how does he reply to her? This is what we call it an invalid analogy. Uh, because simply there is no comparison between answering four out of five in any exam and skipping a faridah such as or a pillar such as a prayer. No one is exempt from praying except women during the menses. Sister Um Saud also wants to know if a woman has to cover her feet when she's praying. The four fuqaha, Abu Hanifa, or Malik, or Shafi'i, or Ahmed, the, the greatest representatives of the fiqh schools, are in agreement. It is haram. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Before the break, we mentioned some statements of some of the scholars of the past um, about how wealth, for example, Sufyan rahimahullah, said that wealth is a weapon of the believer. And we said that what these scholars were trying to say, or what they meant, is that if wealth is used lawfully, it can be considered praiseworthy. And this is especially the case when one uses it to perform good deeds, such as giving it in charity spending it on his family, and even spending it on himself to make it easier for him to do certain acts of worship. An example of the latter could be, for example, if a person bought a nice car to make it easy for him to travel to, far, to a faraway masjid, for example, or to travel to gatherings of sacred knowledge. In this case, the person will be actually rewarded for spending his money on a car. In the same way, uh, for example, if a, if a person could use his wealth to do other righteous things, and we'll come to this point, inshallah, shortly. But in conclusion, wealth is like a matchstick. One can use it to burn himself, or he can use it to light a fire and cook on it, for praiseworthy, uh, praiseworthy reasons. Now, wealth has religious as well as worldly benefits. And everybody knows about its worldly benefits, and that's why 
so many people busy themselves trying to attain it. But as for the religious advantages, they are restricted into three broad categories. Three broad categories. What do you think these could be? I think uh, uh, these categories cannot be just restricted to the akhra or the afterlife, but it can be uh, include the dunya and the, the life in terms of giving benefit to the to the Islam in general. Yeah, for example, this, like spreading yeah. education, knowledge, right. So, health. for example, if a person spent money on building a mosque, building a, exactly. a school uh, or madrasa or something like this, um, that's, that's a praiseworthy uh, religious uh, reason. Exactly, because Islam orders us to, to seek knowledge, to seek improvement, to, yeah. to do our work right. Yeah, exactly. And in the same light, you could say that it has the benefits in the, in the worldly life as well. For instance, improving the infrastructure of a town, mm. maybe providing water for its inhabitants. Yeah, and a person could get reward for this. But we're talking about religious benefits. A lot of people know about the worldly benefits. Mm. And that's why they seek the wealth. Mm. But a lot of people don't know that there are religious benefits of seeking wealth. For example, the person would spend the money for, to gain good deeds for himself, spending in charity, you know, spend it to... As to seek knowledge. What's the fifth pillar of Islam? Hajj. Hajj. And most people, they don't live in Mecca, so they have to spend money to get to Mecca, buy an airplane ticket, or, or whatever else, you know, he needs to get to Mecca. Uh, in the same way, uh, going on jihad. Okay, in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu you would have offensive and defensive jihad. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would... Uh, obviously gather the wealth or ask some of the companions to gather the wealth so, and the rich companions would give a lot of wealth the rich companions would give a lot of wealth uh, for <coughs> for example uh, buying cavalry or armor, weaponry all this, the Muslims would do that at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu so this was considered a praiseworthy, uh, praiseworthy uh, reason to gather wealth I think Uthman spent so much that Prophet Sallallahu said that nothing will harm him after that. Hey. Yes, yes. So that's a and benefit for him. Exactly. And also Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Uh, you remember the story between the, 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 if you like, the race between Abu Bakr and Umar? Hmm. What is it? Was it that uh, Umar radiallahu anhu had, uh, had some wealth at that time? So he gave half of his wealth and he thought that he would outdo Abu Bakr radiallahu this yes, time. Yes, he wanted to outdo Abu Bakr. So when the Prophet asked for wealth for an expedition, I believe it was an expedition, uh, he, Umar radiallahu anhu took everything and divided it into two. Everything that he had. And he took it and gave it away. And he thought, okay, alhamdulillah. And he saw Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu bringing less than him in quantity. So he said, ah, alhamdulillah, I've outdone. Finally, I've outdone Abu Bakr. Of course, this is a good thing. It's good to race one another to do good deeds. For the sake of Allah, of course, not for the sake of showing off. But then what actually happened? I think Abu Bakr uh, Prophet asked him, what have you left for his family? And he said uh, he had left nothing apart from Allah's messenger. In other words, he'd given away everything in charity. And then? So Umar Radiyan realized that <coughs> he, can't, he had, he he had can't been have, outdone. He, can't he only gave him. half, well, Abu Bakr then gave That's right. Him. So even though in quantity, Umar Radiyallahu Anhu had given more in charity, in reality, Abu Bakr had outdone him عنه, because he had given everything he had in charity. Um, so we can summarize these uh, in three main points. But we'll look at those after we've seen some statements of some of the people on the street regarding the issue of love of this world. Uh, who people uh, are only thinking about their uh, life. Uh, without uh, thinking about the akhir is a person just thinking and uh, living his life uh, without thinking in uh, what will happen in the uh, a person should acquire and spend his wealth in many things um, uh, in in many good ways one of which um, in charities others uh, can he can adopt uh, to children he can spend uh, his money in uh, building good stuff like mosques um, churches um, other other uh, places for ad adopting uh, kids from the street. 
Actually, it is a double-edged weapon because uh, the believer can, you know, he can go away from from all the, the religious uh, thoughts of uh, any of uh, of him, and they can, you know, he can uh, do sins uh, for with wealth. Uh, but another one, on the contrary, he can, you know, he can build mosques, he can uh, help the poor. Very pertinent points made there. We we're talking before listening to their statements about how. The, uh, the, the, how one can advantage his religious affairs or how wealth can be an advantage for his religious affairs. And we said they can be broken down into three main categories. And we can summarize that by saying that when a person, the first one is when a person spends on himself in acts of worship, as we mentioned, like jihad or hajj or on things that help him fulfill acts of worship, such as on a house and food and drink. Because if, he, if a person does not have enough wealth to fulfill his basic needs, such as his house, such as his uh, food and drink, clothing and so on, then he will not find it easy for his heart to be free, to be empty of anything else, so that he can uh, leave his heart solely for his religion and for his acts of worship. So these, this is a praiseworthy reason to accumulate wealth. Secondly, when a person spends on others, this can be summarized as being of four types. He can... Uh, spend on others in charity, uh, he can spend on them in hospitality, for example when guests come to his house and he spends a lot of money. We know that Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, what did he do when guests came to him? He slaughtered a sheep. He slaughtered a whole sheep, okay, when a few guests came to him. Uh, likewise, there was one story of one of the uh, early Muslims where he only had a horse that's all he had in terms of his own horse, his own riding beast. And he had no meat in the house, no food in the house. And a guest came and he ordered for the horse to be sacrificed and that be laid out, the horse meat be laid out for food. So he, it's like, I know it's a silly example, but it's like sacrificing your car, okay, perhaps selling the car taking the money and then spending it all on food for one guest. I mean, it's, it's quite a big sacrifice. Uh, so this is the second type. Firstly, charity, hospitality, safeguarding one's honor. How can one spend money to safeguard his honor? Wearing clothes, buying money for clothes. That's one way of looking at it. But I think when the scholars mention this, they often talk about when a person is speaking badly against you. And in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu there was a certain type of media. What was that media? Poetry. poetry. The poetry. The poets. Exactly. The poets were the media of that time. And they, they got together, the kuffar among them, and they, they, they carried an onslaught against the Prophet Sallallahu and against the Muslims. Okay. So the Prophet Sallallahu encouraged his own poet. Who is his own poet? Hassan Ibn Thabit uh, and he encouraged him to reply and respond to their media the, the, the media of the Kuffar uh, actually in the same way we can do that in today's time we know the media onslaught against Islam against the Muslims especially in the West so it is praiseworthy for a Muslim to spend money and to set up institutions of media be that channels or be that Islamic channels, or Islamic newspapers, magazines, and all Software, these kind of things. Okay, And it doesn't just have to be uh, talking purely on religious matters, if you like, but even world affairs from a balanced and correct uh, angle. As we know, the media, they only often give a side of the view that is pertinent to their agenda. Uh, so it, these are all praiseworthy matters, and the scholars speak about this. Uh, so to defend one's own personal honor, the honor of a Muslim, but more importantly to also defend the honor of Islam, the, the, the sum'ah if you like, the, the honor and reputation of the Muslims. And one should use the media for that. Um, likewise, uh, so for example to pay someone to stop slandering him. And also wages for hiring others. Okay, this is the fourth type of this. You pay money as a uh, wage for hiring others. So this is where it can help you in your religious uh, way. The third is when somebody doesn't spend on particular individuals or particular people, certain people or certain objects,
but he spends on some, some things that produce a common benefit or a public interest. Examples of this, as what you mentioned earlier, things like building masajid, mosques, uh, building bridges, bring it, uh, you know, uh, schools, and all these kind of public uh, interests of public uh, of the public. Yani. So these are all praiseworthy things with regards to the religion of Islam. They're religious. They are actually religious. A person is rewarded for gathering wealth for that purpose and spending it for that purpose. In the next episode, inshallah, we'll speak about some of the harms of wealth uh, which can occur on a person's religion as well as his, uh, on his worldly affairs. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم